So, <clears throat> good evening. We'll be talking about comprehensive basic neuroanatomy in this class. And uh, it's a simplified version so that uh, you can quickly revise the neuroanatomy part of it. Hello, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Nice. Uh, thank you. All right. So some of these parts we are not going to take right now. We'll go on to the brainstem part. Uh, morning we dealt uh, part of the course in the morning session. Where we left is that uh, we'll talk about brainstem. And uh, so from the here onwards, we'll uh, discuss brainstem. Brainstem, as you can see, has got uh, midbrain, pons, and medulla. And most of the cranial nerves are attached here. And it's very helpful for us in localization. And uh, you can see the spinal accessory nerve is formed here in this region, vagus nerve. Vestibulo, cochlear, glossopharyngeal, facial, and these are at the junction of the pons and medulla. You can see the pyramids which are carrying the corticospinal tract fibers coming down. And these are pons which has got the big trigeminal nerve which is located here. And the inferior colliculus is the trochlear nerve, and the superior colliculus is the oculomotor nerve. And Above that, you can see the optic asthma and optic nerve, and you can see the mammillary bodies sandwiched here. And these are the cerebral peduncles which are carrying the corticospinal tract on either side. So, brainstem, if you look at the lateral part, you can remember that this is like a, um, like a track where the ascending and descending fibers are going up and down, and it's like a highway. So many fibers travel from brain to the spinal cord, antiphon cells, from receptors, spinal thalamic tract, posterior columns, carrying sensations to craniard, spinal cerebellar fibers. You can see the midbrain region, the pons and the medulla, and you can see the abducens nerve. So all the cranial nerves except oculomotor, optic, yes, all are related to brainstem. And Posteriorly, you can see a trochlear nerve, which is the peculiarity of the trochlear nerve. It's got, it arises from the posterior part of the midbrain and also it decussates at its origin only. That's the two of the two most important aspects of trochlear nerve, which supplies the superior oblique muscle and which helps us an in torsion and down and inside into no it's to see the medially downwards gaze and uh, its dysfunction causes difficulty in climbing down the stairs so to recapitulate midbrain most superior portion pons middle portion middle and lowest portion and uh, brainstem functions as i said it regulates major life functions heartbeat respiration etc it mediates head and neck reflexes. These are called some of the writing reflexes, also it mediates and the gag reflex. Also, via cranial nerves, you can see the next slides. And reticular activating system that is present in the brainstem is the ascending up, and it uh, supplies both the several hemispheres and causes alertness and wakefulness. These are the main brainstem functions regulating major life functions head and neck reflexes, alertness and wakefulness. So the internal organization of uh, brainstem, if you look at it, this is called the tegmental region and tectum region. Tectum is the posterior part, tegmentum is the anterior part, which has got reticular formation, which is important for consciousness. The inferior olivary nucleus, such as motor movement, control and coordination, that is the posterior columns, which are ending in the Nucleus gracilis and cuneatus and second order neurons, they cross as fibers and they cross and 
enter the cere cerebellum and these are also present there red nucleus which has got an action of the flexor tone the posterior part of the brain stem that is a tectum superior colliculus is mediates the vision the inferior colliculi are the hearing now i showed you the cerebellar peduncles the ventral part of the pons motor movement error correction because of this upon dented to rubrothalmo cortical traps we can see the various cranial nerves which we we have to remember and this is the olfactory nerve which is here and the optic nerve second nerve and the common oculomotor nerve trochlear nerve and external oculomotor this this oculomotor nerve complex the one central muscle is the midline nucleus which supplies the levator palpebrae superioris on both sides so if there is a ptosis on both sides the localization becomes central unilateral ptosis is hardly ever caused by any central lesion so one of two of the peculiarities is that uh, the superior rectus muscle is supplied by the contralateral third nerve nucleus the rem remaining extraocular muscles that is medial rectus inferior rectus and inferior oblique are supplied and ipsilateral so this is another important option so the pupil is also the pupillary constrictor fibers travel through third cranial nerve and if you have a third cranial nerve you may get the cross hemiplegia it's called weber syndrome an important point is to look at the pupil pupil is dilated or pupil is not it so was dilated become surgical pupil and aneurysm from posterior communicating artery can press and cause this herniation syndromes that's a part of the oculomotor complex now for that you got a trigeminal nerve which supplies the extensively to the face area we will again talk about it it has got three branches ophthalmic ophthalmic branch maxillary branch and mandibular branch and it's on either side it supplies the lateral and medial pterygoids also the mastar muscle and temporalis muscle and these are the muscles which help in the jaw movements there will be deviation of the jaw if there is a paralysis of uh, or damage to the trigeminal nerve then you have this facial nerve which supplies all the superficial muscles of the face that is the frontalis muscle orbicularis oculi orbicularis oris zygomaticus major zygomaticus minor levator angle or this platis mentalis all these small muscles which are important for facial expression are supplied by the facial nerve and the auditory nerve and that's eighth and vestibular nerve this is the, this travels through the internal auditory meatus to reach the end organ then you have the vagus nerve and accessory nerve and glossopharyngeal nerve and hypoglossal nerve these are the main cranial nerves which we are going to study so cranial nerves one so there is a mnemonic which i don't fancy the mnemonics but you can remember olfactory optic oculomotor trochlear trigeminal abducens facial auditory glossopharyngeal vagus spinal accessory and oc so so this the some of these nerves you have to know in detail these are the optic nerve trigeminal nerve facial glossopharyngeal vagus spinal accessory and hypoglossal nerves these are to be you know learned in detail olfactory bulb fiber type that is the somatic visceral afferents the afferents are coming from the receptors on the nose and the function is smell and problem cause anosmia optic nerve origin is fiber type superior i mean that is uh, the, the somatic special afferents vision is a function and what what uh, tell us that they are saying is a lateral geniculate body that lateral geniculate body you can see the visual field the right visual field left visual field the right visual field has a temporal portion and a nasal portion similarly the left visual field has a nasal and a temporal portion the peculiarity is the crossing of the fibers at the optic chasma of the optic nerve and when near the optic chasma what happens is 
the nasal fibers which are subserving the temporal field on in each eye field they cross to the other side whereas the temporal fibers which are subserving the nasal temporal field uh, visual field region they don't cross but all these fibers they travel backwards to the pulvinar of the thalamus and lateral geniculate nucleus and some fibers go to superior colliculus and rest of them are geniculocalcare interactor or, or the optic radiation so that's the importance of a visual we are not going to talk much about optic nerve but there's so many things to understand there the foveal vision that the max the maximum vision is so located in the macular region the macular representation is the calcarean cortex is the maximum so it's very difficult to lose vision and also it has got bilateral vascular supply to the cortex in the occipital lobe so you will have always a macular sparing and hemianopia like picture in cortical blindness or it may be sometimes they may not be aware that they are blind also the oculomotor nerve is the origin of the midbrain the it has got somatic efferents and visceral efferents that means motor fiber motor fibers are always going down to the efferent and reaching the target organs the most eyes left and right controls eye field which makes me the major issue is that only and also there are visceral efferents which mediate the pupillary constrictor function loss of pupillary reflex and papillary edema and ptosis are the important aspects of the oculomotor nerve so we have discussed now we are going to do a trochlear nerve with the midbrain i have told the peculiarities of the trochlear nerve it originates in the dorsal aspect of the midbrain and it decussates at the origin only and right trochlear nerve supplies the left superior oblique and the fiber type is called the somatic efferents general and somatic efferents and moves eyes up and down trochlear nerve it causes vertical diplopia and nystagmus difficulty moving eyes up and down so that's the superior oblique usually the person will have difficulty in climbing down the stairs the trigeminal nerve with origin is pons it has got fibers that are subserving the function of a somatic visceral efferent that means motor and general somatic afferents mean that they are bringing touch sensation temperature vibration for face mouth and two thirds of the tongue and uh, the efferents are important in chewing of the muscles loss of about sensations difficulty in chewing abnormal jaw jerk jerk that is jaw jerk jaw reflex so you will have uh, uh, a type of sensory loss and uh, if ophthalmic branch maxillary and mandibular are the affected which are carrying the sensations then you can have distribution in the concerned uh, branches but sometimes you may have in the second order neuron affliction then you have got onion peel type of sensory loss all over around the mouth so this is the ophthalmic zone which you can see here ophthalmic zone the mandibular zone here this sorry here and the maxillary zone and this is a trigeminal nerve you can see the branches which are coming and supplying various parts of the face right abduction of sixth cranial nerve its so origin is in pons and it is also efferent means general somatic efferent means the motor it it rotates the eyes the kishore nen class lo nan varintha matra Uh, rotates eyes out eyes rotate in undeveloped nystagmus so usually abducens nerve causes lateral rectus palsy which will give rise to diplopia on looking ahead uh, then we go on to the facial nerve it's more important nerve it's also origin of pons and it has got these type of fibers you can see somatic visceral afferent that means they are supplying the muscles of the visceral origin general visceral efferents and afferent fibers are general somatic afferents and special afferents visceral afferents so 
you can see the muscles, special visceral efferents, muscles of face, general somatic afferent sensation near ears. That means there is ear near ear, you have the facial nerve that is taking up the sensation, taste in anti two thirds of the tongue and salivary glands, the facial paralysis and paresis and taste loss. And we are just touching the basic anatomy, not going into the details at this stage. We'll have more classes later. We'll finish uh, as much as possible on the orientation of the general anatomy, the facial nerve supplies, various muscles. And now we'll go on to the next nerve. That is the, you can see the facial palsy, which we can learn a bit. You can see the facial area of the motor cortex is here. And UMN lesion of the corticobulbar tract because of the strokes, maybe an internal capsule, will cause lower part of the face to be affected. Facial motor nucleus of pons is, you know that, and superior and inferior divisions are there. The superior division are the upper part of the face has got bilateral representation. So in strokes, usually for UMN lesion, the lower part is usually affected. And you can see the muscles that uh, we have already mentioned them, facial expression muscles, frontalis, orbicularis, ocular, buxinator, orbicularis, oris, and platys. These are the muscles supplied by the seventh cranial now. All right. So vestibular cochlear now, also known as auditory now, we can see the, the scala tympani. This is the spiral ganglion. You can see the nerve that is taking away the auditory responses from the ear, you can see here. This is a basilar membrane and the tectorial membrane, the part of the inner ear, the scalar vestibule, this is from the organ of corti, bony cochlear, cochlear duct. So these are the important, which are subserving the uh, auditory function, known as auditory now, pons and medulla junction, it arises, and you've got special somatic, uh, special, sensory afferents and the hearing and balance are controlled by vestibular cochlear nerve. The glossopharyngeal nerve also originates from the pons and medulla junction. It has got special visceral efferents to pharyngeal muscles, also general visceral efferent to parotid gland, which promotes salivation. General visceral afferents, it is getting sensations to the brain from middle ear pharynx and posterior one third of the tongue, and also special visceral afferents taste on the posterior one third of the tongue, absent gag and swallow reflex, loss of taste and loss of pharyngeal movement, where ovula can be deviated to one side and soft palate start, you know, uh, movements are reduced in soft palate. So these are the important glossopharyngeal now, which you can see is coming and supplying the pharyngeal muscles, right? So clinically, the individual will present with difficulty in swallowing and nasal regurgitation of fluids. The vagus nerve is a large nerve. It originates in the medulla, the special visceral efferents, and those are pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles, general visceral efferents, that is heart, lungs, digestive tract, general somatic afferents, tactile sensation to the external auricular canal, general visceral afferents, pain from the mucous membranes, Special visceral afferents taste from epiglottis and pharynx. So these are the types of fibers which are embedded in the vagus nerve. Absent gag and swallow reflex and loss of vela movement, loss of voice. These are the features of the vagus nerve dysfunction. You can see the vagus nerve, that's how it's originating from the brain stem and going to the vagus, uh, to the abdominal organs and heart. It's a very big nerve that's supplying the most of the in abdominal organs, spinal axis you know, medulla, spinal cord. It is a special visceral efferent. It's neck and shoulder muscles, that is the trapezius and stenocleidomastoid mustard muscles are supplied by spinal axis nerve and its dysfunction leads droopy shoulders and movement of the neck, uh, the movement of the neck. So this is a, a where the spinal axis nerve is coming and supplying these muscles. As I said, this is only sensitization class. We'll not discuss much. Just we'll just refresh few aspects of the pineal nerves. The hypoglossal nerve also has got medulla origin. It is the efferent now, supplying muscles of the tongue like genioglosses, hyoglosses, the inner uh, internal muscles of the tongue and external muscles of the tongue, 
and the problems with this function of this nerve is loss of tongue movement, tongue fasciculations, tongue atrophy. So you can observe on clinically all these. This is a hypoglossal nerve which is supplying the tongue. You can see in this diagram. So that brings us to the a part called the cerebellum and cerebellum and macroscopic anatomy. It has a vermis, which you can see the vermis, anterior lobe, which is affected mostly in the alcoholics, the posterior lobe. And you can see a cross section, a parasitical section. You can see the orbital villi and the folia, cerebellar folia. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Almost eleven to ten folia are present. And if the number increases, that suggests it is atrophy. So now look at the very beautiful anatomy of the cerebellum. It has got three layers, and three is a number closely associated with cerebellum. It has got three peduncles, that is superior, middle, and inferior cerebellar peduncle. It has got three nuclei and dentate nucleus and emboliform and vestiges. All the three nuclei are present, and also its cortex has got three layers. And what is the three layers? One is the granule cell layer. This is the granular layer, Purkinje layer, and molecular layer. The Purkinje layer is a major efferent, efferent pathway of the cerebellum. All the cerebellar outputs go through the Purkinje cells. Above that is molecular layer. Now, what are these layers containing? They are containing fibers, Purkinje cells. These are neurons, stellate cells, basket cells, and all these are connected by white matter triads, and that is the mossy fibers. Climbing fibers and mossy fibers. These are the fibers which are entering the cerebellum. What are these fibers doing? These are getting sensory inputs from all over the body, also from the brain. And cerebellum receives the maximum sensory input that is possible because it has to fine-tune so many of the movements and fine-tune the balance. So the major pathways, vestibular cerebellar pathway, overall body posture, balance, coordination of the eye movements or its purview, vermal spinocerebellar pathway, trunk and uh, girdle muscle tone and posture is uh, the responsibility of uh, spinocerebellar tract. And paravermial spinocerebellar part, distal muscle groups, tone and plastic. And pontocerebellar planning, initiating, timing of volitional motor activity, all these are the functions. You can see oral posture and balance. You require cerebellum coordination of eye movements, trunk and girdle muscle tone and posture, distal muscle group tone and posture, planning, initiating, and timing of volitional motor activity. So let us summarize the functions. It helps in planning, monitoring and correction of motor movements using sensory feedback. It coordinates fine motor activity, it monitors head and body position. It participate, participates in learning of the new motor skills. So these are the motor functions of the cerebellum. One, two, three, and four, important. Perception of speech and language, verbal working memory, verbal fluency, grammar processing, writing, reading, all these linguistic features are also controlled by the cerebellum. And so the main problem happens is loss of agility whenever cerebellum is disturbed and its function is disturbed. You develop a cerebellar type of dysarthria where you will have stress on some syllables and stress not on some syllables in explosive speech. Also, you may have difficulty in articular agility, loose articular agility. So these things can be tested by bedside. The most important test what we do for is nystagmus testing, finger to nose, finger nose test, and also in upper limb we put the didacokinesia test. Also you, you can have reinforcement uh, testing. In the lower limbs you have knee heel test also. Uncoordinated sloppy movements may indicate severe damage on tandem walking. So cerebral damage is, results in dismet as ataxia. Ataxia is discoordinated clumsy movements. 
dysmetria over or under shooting touching a mark dysrhagokinesia inability to perform rapid alternating movements of hands or mouth nystagmus fast involuntary eye movements either side to side or up and down that happens ataxic dysarthria slurred or scanning broken into syllable speech and reduced muscle tone and reflexes and the muscle tired very easily these are the feature core features in ataxia dysmetria dysrhagokinesia nystagmus ataxic dysarthria and hypotonia these are the features of cerebellum and cerebellar hemispherical syndrome vermal syndrome predicts ataxia cerebellar agenesis these are some of the disorders which you come across we'll talk more about this in the class on cerebellar disorders that brings us to the important part of dian keplon which is thalamus thalamus is a crude center for sensation it's a real station from here the third order neuron center the spinothalamic tract which is formed in the spinal cord the peripheral receptors present in the skin on the foot on the thigh everywhere they enter them. that means that that neuron which is present in the dorsal root ganglion is called unipolar neuron the peripheral process brings the impulses into the dorsal root ganglion from there the impulses or the action potentials travel through the proximal uh, axon into the spinal cord enters through the dorsal horn and synapses at the same level or one level above or below to give rise to second order neuron which crosses in front of the central canal and ascends up as spinothalamic tract this second order neuron ends in thalamus and from there the third order neuron goes to the parietal lobe this is the the the, the, the crude sensation one part the other part is the proprioception the vibration the the brain should know where your hand is where your fingers are where your toes this is subserved by what's called as vibration joint position sense which is conducted by large fibers because this requires forced conduction and saltatory conduction so the large fibers and alpha ea fibers they conduct these impulses to the dorsal root ganglion that unipolar neuron then happen, the central process doesn't cross it ascends up ipsilaterally up to the nucleus gracilis and cuneatus there it synapses with the internal arcuate fibers which cross to the other side and they ascend as medial lemniscus and reach the thalamus that ends the second order neuron and from there it goes to the parietal so it's a relay station it sits above the brain stem it's gateway to cerebral cortex it relays sensory except smell perception of pain temperature and touch impart sense of pleasantness and noxiousness to the individual maintains cortical arousal attention and sleep wake cycle so all the reticular activating system fibers are passing through the thalamus you can see the thalamus and you can see this is the coronal section this is a hypothalamus and subthalamus and this is a thalamus area and this is epithalamus so these are the parts of the, on the coronal view if you look at the sagittal view it, this is the thalamus this is the thalamus is this this above the lateral ventricle this corpus callosum the frontal lobe the central sulcus and you see the spinal cord that is attached to the middle oblongata from their pons and the midbrain so this is a sagittal picture of that and it's a relay station it has got various nuclei and these nuclei are no they they can be divided into three types of nuclei and uh, the internal medullary lamina divides into the into this internal medullary lamina it divides anterior nucleus ventral anterior ventral lateral and also lateral dorsal 
So these are the nuclei which are doing various functions, which we'll uh, we'll discuss in later. So one is going to the ventral posterior, going to the somatosensory cortex, the lateral genuclear body to the visual cortex, medial genuclear body to the auditory cortex, and so this is the pulvinar, the back portion, and the dorsal medial nucleus to the prefrontal cortex, the connections, interlaminar nuclei and medial nuclei, internal. So these anterior nucleus. So these parts have got different functions, which we'll learn slowly. We can see that the, the thalamic nucleus, let us recapitulate, the medial, dorsal medial nucleus, and its afferent inputs are coming from hypothalamus, amygdala, under other thalamic nuclei, and the efferents go to prefrontal cortex and septal area. The lateral dorsal group, the lateral ventral group, the lateral dorsal is uh, lateral dorsal, lateral posterior, pulvinar. These are also connected to the lateral dorsal or LD is connected to hypothalamus and other thalamic nuclei. And the efferent outputs go to septal area and singular gyrus and parahippocampal gyrus. This is a part of the salient network. Lateral posterior is a ventral posterior, medial and lateral nuclei, and they are connected superior and inferior parietal lobe. The pulvinar, that is superior colliculus, visual association cortices, font life fields. This is the superior colliculus and visual association cortex and front eye cortex. These are the areas. And let's learn what is association cortex. Apart from the primary sensory areas in the brain, that is the parietal lobe, the post central gyrus, the olfactory cortex, olfactory lobe, and the visual cortex and auditory cortex. So apart from all these four, the areas of the brain are called association cortex. Each primary sensory area is surrounded by unimodal association cortex and there are some cross modal association cortices and anteriorly and posteriorly they match the auditory input the visual input and also from the memory storage they are able to process the information and give a name or a shape to the hand thing at hand the lateral ventral group also ventral anterior, basal ganglia and cerebellum, motor cortices, ventral lateral, basal ganglia and cerebellum, motor cortices, ventral posterior lateral, medial lemniscus. So really, this is a very important part of the brain. Ventral posterior medial is a trigeminothalamic tract and that's also called a postcentral gyrus. Medial geniculate body, that is inferior colliculus, primary auditory cortex, so lateral genuclear body is optic tract and primary visual cortex. So the anterior nucleus is mammillary body and cingulate cortex. It's what I was a part of the salient cortex, salience network that, that mediates empathy, interlaminar, central median and parafascicular regions, reticular formation, other thalamic nuclei, and so it goes to basal ganglion. The reticular nuclei, and these are connected to the basal ganglia. And midline nuclei are also, they are connected to cingulate gyrus and amygdala. So you can see so many nuclei are there in the thalamus. And thalamus is a relay station. And blood supply to the thalamus is internal carotid artery. You can see the posterior common, posterior communicating artery, this and then you see the posterior cerebral artery coming from the vertebral basal nerve system. And it is the supplying sub branches that posterior choroidal artery is coming here. Posterior choroidal artery is supplying lateral genuclear body. And the paramedian branches supply various muscles, you know, ventral anterior, ventral lateral, ventral posterior, pulvinar, dorsal medial, interlaminar nuclei. This is the cutest diagram I have seen. You can Remember this diagram very much, and you can see the posterior communicator. This is the anterior circulation, that is the internal carotid artery, and this is coming from the posterior circulation and the posterior choroidal artery, that's the posterior cerebral artery. So all these areas nuclei are richly supplied by the blood. 
So design rousey syndrome is a thalamic syndrome, also known as thalamic pain syndrome, hemiparesis, hemiplegia, dysesthesia, slight attacks, yeah. cognition, speech, and language are intact, but the individuals suffer from the pain, that is thalamic pain. Sometimes you have thalamic aphasia, that fluent verbal output with semantic paraphysias, mild auditory comprehension issues, mild to normal or repeated, uh, repeating skills. The repetition is affected. You can see the fluent aphasic conditions are compared. One is a when the case is a fluent, transcortical sensory, conduction, thalamic, and anomic. And all this fluency is increased or preserved except conduction. All suffer from auditory comprehension. And oh, sorry, um, anomic also. Repetition is affected in only in cortical sensory. So these are some of the thalamic aphasia is fluent aphasia, verbal output with semantic paraphysias. That is a thalamus which has got a fluent role and mild auditory comprehension issues which is very mild and mild to normal repeating skills. So the major issue is only fluency, fluent verbal output with semantic paraphysias. So hypothalamus is a regulator, it's a pituitary gland, autonomic nervous system control, metabolism, water balance, sleep awake mechanisms, the body temperature, fluid intake regulation, secondary sex characteristics, all these are functions of the hypothalamus. You can see where hypothalamus is here, this is the hypothalamus. You can see the midbrain, the pons and middle of and the way the pineal gland is there, you can see, and the pituitary gland is here in this region. So, this is the sagittal uh, the section. The hypothalamus and pituitary gland, pituitary gland, as you know, the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary, which is on this side, has got only few hormones. And that is oxytocin and ADH, antidiuretic hormone. This is uh, the these two hormones are secreted. Oxytocin is important in lactation and uterine contractions. Mm -hmm. And antidiuretic hormone or ADH uh, helps in the mm -hmm. absorption of fluid from distal convoluted tubules in the kidney. In the anterior pituitary has got. Uh, very many uh, hormones which act on the genitalia, on the ovary. These are luteinizing hormone, follicular stimulating hormone. And also you have adenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, and uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, growth hormone, melanocyte stimulating hormone. These are all the secretions from the anterior pituitary. Now all these hormone secretions are controlled by the supercenter at hypothalamus than where you have neurosecretory cells. So one of some of the disorders you can just mention, pituitary problems, Cushing disease, endocrine disorder caused by tumor on the pituitary, high levels of cortisol are there. Uh, high levels of cortisol. So symptoms include mood phases, emotional disturbances, osteoporosis, hypertension, buffalo hump, obesity, amenorrhea loss of uh, menstruation, muscle weakness, and abdominal stripes. So this is the, uh, in short, the pituitary problems are acromegaly. That means extreme largeness. It's caused by pituitary tumor. Results in pituitary producing too much human growth hormone. Symptoms include large stature, large nose, large jaw, large hands, hypertension, and peripheral neuropathy. That's acromegaly for you. There's some part which I showed you, the epithalamus, which connects limbic system to forebrain, other parts of the brain, pineal gland, produces melatonin, habenula, stramedula. The important thing about epithalamus is it controls sleep-wake cycle and all factors like this. Subthalamus is another region just below the thalamus and connects basal ganglia to the motor cortex, thus more related to basal ganglia than thalamus, the damage can result in hemibalismus, that is subthalamus nucleus. So that brings us to the basal ganglia, and they're also known as corpus striatum, and mm -hmm. these are three of them, globus pallidus, putamen, corded nucleus. They regulate the complex mode of functions such as posture, locomotion, balance, arm swinging, and 
they inhibit the function and coordinates motor behavior and uses dopamine. The dopamine is main the neurotransmitters in the basal ganglia. And if you look at the concept of how the movement, the concept of movement, if you want to move anything, the concept originates in the association context. And from there, the action potentials take go to go to basal ganglia, where it unleashes the programs that are required for conduct of the movement. From there, the impulses go to the cerebellum to give it a correct balance of the movement, correct trajectory, correct length and speed and acceleration. All these things are given. From there, the fibers go down to the anti-horn cells. So these are the important aspects of the basal ganglia. So you can see them cordage nucleus, globus pallidus, and pitan. And the all three important structures. And basal ganglion, look at them isolation. See, this is amygdala and tail of caudate nucleus, which is such a big one. You see, this is the head of the caudate here, which you can see in the lateral ventricle or the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. And that is taking a turn around the thalamus and uh, pyramid globus pallidus and comes in the tail of the caudal nucleus and ends in amygdala. So you got a medial genital body on this side, lateral genital body on here, medial and lateral. The symptoms are tremors, ethetosis, chorea, balismus, rigidity, dystonia, bradycardia. There are four core features which you should remember always. For the basal ganglion, the one is tremor, that is a resting tremor. When on action, this tremor disappears. Second is rigidity. It is contrasted with spasticity. Rigidity means resistance to all types of movements across the joint. Whereas in spasticity, it is velocity dependent first point. But also, it it's differentially you no know, spread. That's uh, in the upper limbs the tone is increased in the adductors, also in the elbow flexors, wrist flexors, also finger flexors. All those uh, things are increased in tone. That is why it's called spasticity. Whereas if you look at the rigidity, when a person with Parkinson's disease has got the same type of tone, whether abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, wrist dorsiflexion, or plantar, I mean, uh, palmar flexion, is, is attempted. So that's the most important rigidity, tremor, rigidity, and bradykinesia, slowness in doing anything. Bradykinesia. If you ask him to repeatedly tap the fingers, close the and open the fingers and turn the wrist, all the movements have become very slow. And the fourth one is a postural imbalance. These individuals develop difficulty in getting up from chair and they, they have a tendency to fall on either side. The posture in the instability of this. These are the four core features tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural tremor. So, Parkinson's disease is a prototype and a progressive neurological disease described by James Parkinson in 1817. Remember the shaking palsy, rather by degenerating the midbrain substantia like that, and loss of dopamine to the basal ganglia. The symptoms include muscle rigidity, dyskinesias. Resting and pill rolling tremors, shuffling gait, weak voice, dysarthria, flat effect, poor posture, and dysphagia. The Parkinson treatment medications, levodopa, dopamine agonists, anticholinergist, mau inhibitors, COMT inhibitors, and the drug, the, the list increases. The treatment is surgery, driven stimulation, and pyridotomy can be done. Huntington's disease, another disease, it is a progressive hereditary neurological disease due to degeneration of the basal ganglia. Average onset is around 35 years of age, autosomal dominant pattern. Symptoms include severe chorea, that is a hyperkinetic movement disorder, ethetosis, emotional and personality changes, thought qualities, dysarthria, dysphagia, and dementia. So this is one of the prototype, trinucleotide type disorders. The other basal ganglia problems, emotional processing problem, most consistent sign, disinhibition, impulsivity, inappropriate behavior, all these things can be seen in Parkinson's patients. 
That brings us to the part called brain ventricles, fluid-filled spaces in the brain. It contains four ventricles, right lateral ventricle, left lateral ventricle, third ventricle, and fourth ventricle. Each ventricle has a structure called the choroid plexus that produces the cerebral spinal fluid. And this choroid plexus is present is present in the wall. So from here, the CSF secretes and goes into the third ventricle and once the fourth ventricle, and from there goes to subarachnoid space. Each ventricle has a structure called the choroid plexus that produces spinal fluid. You can see the lateral ventricle, and this is the third ventricle. And you can see on the lateral aspect, the foramen of Monroe is connecting the lateral ventricles with the third ventricle. You got the lateral ventricles. You are seeing sag view, lateral view. And you can see the fourth ventricle is here. Right. So this is the third. This is the fourth lateral ventricles. So cerebrospinal fluid is produced by choroid plexus. It's found in the brain wide you know, ventricles. And arachnoid space. Arachnoid space is brain and spinal cord called pyometer, arachnoid, and dura meter. And subarachnoid is between pia and arachnoid. There is a fluid, like the cerebral spinal fluid, and it has got uh, uh, it, it has got a cellularity which is less than zero or less than five. It is a protein of the CSF is anywhere between thirty and forty. And sugar is always compared to the corresponding blood sugar. It should be more than 50% of the blood sugar value. So it functions, the protection causes buoyancy, removes waste, transport nutrients and hormones. Right? So, so you can see the cerebrospinal fluid, how the, this is the skin of scalp, bone, dura mater, arachnoid mater. And subarachnoid space, which you can see the subarachnoid space, which is filled with flow. These are meninges and cortex of the brain, you see, and the uh, coronal section. So you can visualize the scalp, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, also the meninges and vertebrae and spinal cord. So hydrocephalus means water on the brain, an accumulation of cerebral spinal fluid which arises from an imbalance in the production and drainage of that fluid. And the main thing is a large head. You can see the large head, which is hydrocephalus. And you can cure that by causing the ventricular peritoneal shunt, or the diversion of the CSF fluid into the abdomen, tubing in the peritoneal cavity. So protection and nourishment of the brain, cerebrum, and all other topics, I think we'll take in another class. We'll stop here. Uh, if anybody has any doubts or questions, they can ask. And uh, there are so many. Uh, this is a basic uh, anatomy exposure. And when we think about more pertinent things, individual diseases later on. So if anybody wants to ask any question or anything or you want to tell, you can tell. If there are no questions, I think I'll say good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, bye. Okay, sir. Bye-bye. Good night, sir. Bye. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night.